standard treatment hook plate. There's two parts. What's up, everybody? I'm the Hook. And I'm the Blade. Welcome to the Hook Blade podcast, where we talk about all things Hook Blades. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to call it the, the Look Blade podcast, because you might have noticed we have a new look. Oh, exactly. <laughs> a new aesthetic. But Tim Tim stepped on my line, so oh, I'm it's so actually sorry. just the Hook Blade podcast. The, the Hooky Blade podcast has a new looking blade. <laughs> Which is also, which is also something you said to me. That's not, I never said that. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. All right. Well, we'll agree or disagree. Um, <laughs> Tim, how are you today? Well, okay, hold on. I should introduce myself. I'm your host Lawson, and with me, as always, is my co-host Tim. And Tim, how are you doing today? I'm I'm doing pretty good. Um, so you know what a pressure cooker is, right? Yeah. And so you can make bombs out of them. I haven't tried that yet. You'll have to Google pressure cooker bomb, <laughs> but, um, but Google it at work. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Or at school and then get arrested. So I got one of those nifty like kitchen gadgets that is a pressure cooker, but it also like it has the functionality of like Ezio's hidden blade. It's got it kills people. <laughs> it's got a pressure cooker. It's got a slow cooker. It can bake. It has air frying capabilities. It can also, uh, what else can? You can sear or saute in it. Air crisp, which is their version of air fry. Slow cook, obviously. I can make yogurt, which will never happen. <laughs> um, and there's a bunch of other stuff. If my mom was listening to this right now, she would be quaking. <laughs> so essentially, this one, yeah. it's it's from the brand Ninja. I'm sure you may have Oh, yeah, I'm seen familiar it. with Ninja. Yeah. So... It's like an all-in-one kitchen appliance, essentially. Um, and I've been like, it has been for anyone who's if for anyone who's ever considered it, it is it's worth every penny because I have had such a easygoing time with it, and I can cook things with such more proficiency. And I'm not a very good cook. That's the thing. It's just a convenience. I got a smart thing. toaster oven once, and it did a lot of different things like that. Like you could broil stuff. You yeah. Could oh, you can broil. You could... That's another function is yeah. broil. I forgot broil. <laughs> Have you seen the June oven? No. The June oven. It's essentially um, your guy Marcus Marcus Aurelius, the guy that you... <laughs> Mar- guy Marquez that... Brownlee, <laughs> the guy that you watch, the tech guy. Yeah, Mark. Yeah, he's the most famous tech reviewer. On yeah, YouTube. I was, I was, I looked at an AMA of his, and he, uh, he was shouting out the June oven. And it's essentially, oh. it's, it's, it's like what you just said. It, it's a smart oven, and it has yeah. cameras built in. So you stick a pop tart in there, and it's like, hey, is this a pop tart you have in our oven? <laughs> and then they, and then have they you inserted it. a pop tart into me, <laughs> and you can like track it on the app. And it has a little probe thermometer so that your meat doesn't get overcooked. Legal note, the Hook Blade podcast is not sponsored by the June Oven <laughs> or Ninja <laughs> or the Breville Smart Oven. <laughs> but, but it's like it's like a Tesla of ovens because <laughs> it constantly updates itself. For instance, <laughs> everyone. Tim. OK, I'll stop. <laughs> No, I was just going to say you're really cute when you get excited about something. Oh, thank you. Couple notes at the top of the show. I, You know how a couple episodes ago I was like, hey, Tim, would you believe it that I'm still sick? And you said no. And I was like, I'm not. <laughs> yes. I can now say with, with scientific certainty that I have had strep throat for two and a half months. <laughs> so I've been sick the entire time. The last time anyone's heard... My non-sick voice on this podcast was episode three. <laughs> Jesus. Not that anyone would notice, because according to some of our friends, you and I sound too similar. Yeah, apparently. I've gotten used to it, I suppose, so I don't even know what you sound like not sick. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't, don't remember. I think I think this is just, yeah, that's my normal voice now. I think this is current. I think I'm currently speaking in a not sick voice. I don't know. I think you sound handsome and smart. And 
charming Aww, all the time. Thank you. Tim, you're like the Juno oven of people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's called the June oven. <laughs> I, I called it Juno by accident. You're the cause, Juno oven of people. Because subliminally, I'm aware on some level that this is an Assassin's Creed podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of Assassin's Creed. <laughs> I wanted to I wanted to follow up a little bit on our last episode because it turns out in the context of the whole I Diona mission that I'm a, I'm actually just a big dummy because there are multiple ways to figure out which one was the good one and which one was the bad one. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> you can you can go to Bird Vision and check them out with your with your Bird Boy. You can uh, just pay attention to the cutscene. Apparently, one of them's choking the other one. So nice. I'm a big, dumb, dummy, idiot, stupid head, actually, it turns out. Aren't we all? Also, I wanted to add, something I forgot to say last week, because of that mission, right, when I was playing on PS4, I actually, in an attempt to get it to unbreak itself, I updated the software on my PS4, and that software update bricked my disk drive. So, Odyssey has taken a lot from me. (laughs) I, I have more reason than most, I would say, to hate that game, and yet... I remain fair and balanced all the time. <laughs> I just, I wanted to put that out there. <laughs> you've, you've sacrificed so much. You've lost so much. Odyssey has literally killed my family at this point, And <laughs> I'm still out here being like, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's got a, it's got a better story than origins. <laughs> it does. <laughs> I, I, I can't say, I can't say for certain. Yeah. You can't comment. So Tim, why are we why are we gathered here today? What's the actual topic of conversation besides cooking appliances and dialogue choices? Well, aside from those two things, uh, you and I ended up replaying the first ever Assassin's Creed, two thousand and seven. OG, the where OG. it all began. Parentheses or did it? Yeah. So this has been interesting. Um, we both replayed Assassin's Creed one, and. We've had some interesting uh, experiences with it. Yeah. I guess the headline for my impressions would be that I kind of, on this particular playthrough, had the opposite experience that I usually have with AC1. <laughs> and I don't know why. Um, yeah. Not like, yeah. oh, I usually like it, but this time I didn't. More that, like, in the past, um, when I would replay it for, like, the marathon and stuff, I would really enjoy the game at first, and I'd be like, wow, this is really fun and good and cool and interesting. And then over time, I would slowly begin to completely hate it, and I would just really not enjoy playing it at all. This time, I actually, I had a lot of trouble with it at first. At first, I was like, oh, this sucks. This is bullshit. I don't want to play this anymore. And I definitely, over the course of the game, I warmed up to it a little bit more. I, I... like I did want to get it over with, not because it was that aggressively like frustrating to play, but more because I just really wanted to play AC2, you know? Yeah. yeah. But but I did, and I don't know if this came across in some of our conversations about it, I did warm up to it a little bit as it was. Yes. How did you how did you feel? So I hadn't replayed it in quite some time. So coming back to it, I was very excited about it, and there's just there's just such there's, so there's certain iconography and seeing it in that game, and just seeing like Damas and Acre and Jerusalem and stuff like it 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 still was as as effective as it was you know when I first played it or what have you. But I had a very similar experience. I was having kind of a rough time with it at first, and you know I mean that could just be because I haven't replayed it in a long time. I'm very rusty, and I'm more used to the recent games than I am to that game for sure for sure um yeah and just in general like you know I I haven't been playing video games as much as I was when I first played Assassin's Creed well not first sorry but when I would have replayed it I haven't been like as active as playing video games so just all around I I I'm not exactly like an expert with AC one and, and, you know, as, as, as some of our friends are, but I definitely warmed up to it later on. I mean, look, all the assassinations being memorable and everything, it's just getting to those assassinations really became kind of a chore, you know? Yeah. And definitely some of those assassination activities or sorry, investigation activities 
got a little tedious more for you than for me because i actually was playing for the first time on pc and yes. there is a a significantly better variety of activities on the pc version interesting yeah. not only they add they add something called informer challenges but informer challenges itself is a pretty broad um selection of activities i found stuff where it was like stealth challenges like go kill all of these guards without getting detected which uh was often pretty fun or you know kill these archers there were races things you had to collect a bunch of flags whereas i believe i guess in the original game you're pretty much limited to to beat someone up pickpocket someone and well, eavesdrop so so what you're describing i actually did have in my version of the game oh really well i had certain informant options like i can go to i can go to an assassin informant and he'll either have me collect some masia flags I can yeah. go kill archers, or I can go kill a very specific kind of guard without anyone else seeing me. So, what did the PC have more of then? I I don't know. I I just was always, I always heard that the director's cut and PC had more, um, like investigation stuff. Was there was there any of those that you didn't mention that like you had to do? Yeah. So I'm I'm looking it up. Ubisoft has. Re- this is an article from 2008 on Eurogamer. Ubisoft has revealed the four new investigation types for Assassin's Creed on PC. There's the rooftop race challenge where you charge from one informant to another within a set time limit. Mm. Archer assassination, which has you murdering rooftop dwelling guards in a set area without being seen. The merchant stand destruction challenge where you have to trash the livelihood of tradesmen tied to your assassination target. And the escort challenge, which has you guide a fellow assassin somewhere safely. Yeah. So, so all I, the ones I didn't mention. I yeah. Do. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I those are the ones I did not see. So there you go. Yeah, so you did have a you did have a bigger variety, which would probably make a lot of it better. I pulled up um I went all the way back to the year twenty fourteen and I found the very first post that was ever made regarding the Assassin's Creed Marathon, which was titled Sixty Five Days Until Unity and Rogue Release. 66 memory sequences in the AC main game. So let's do a sequence a day for 65 days. And this, these were my impressions back then. I said, I loved running down the hills of Masyaf and slaughtering Templars along the way. It was very immersive and the chaos going around me was pretty exhilarating. The very first ever leap of faith was brilliant and epic. I completely forgot how it was so cleverly used as a way of demonstrating the assassins welcoming of death to the Templars. Activating the trap and watching the log- logs crush to Sable's goons was pretty freaking sweet, too. <laughs> oh, this is me as a 15-year-old. <laughs> I get that the tutorial served a pretty important purpose of introducing the character to the gameplay mechanics, but damn if it wasn't the most tedious and cumbersome tutorial I've ever played. Still true. <laughs> I much prefer the other game's usual approach of giving story significance to the tutorial rather than just doing it in an empty Animus techscape. Uh, AC3 did this as well. No coincidence then that... Oh, this is my 2014 me talking. AC1 and AC3 are my least favorite games in the series. Wow. There was so much terrible yet to come, my young self. (laughs) So much terrible yet to come. My third point, Jesus Christ, Altair is such a dick. Damn, I wanted to slap him. (laughs) He's very arrogant and has no respect for the creed or the wishes of his supposed brothers. Um, Amwalim seems very wise and dedicated to the assassin order, but of course, (laughs) we all know the truth now. (laughs) Yeah, we all know. Did you, would you have any comments on this? Did you participate? (laughs) Fuck no. (laughs) (laughs) Aw. Yeah, I guess this is also, this would have been long before you and I ever talked, so it's not like it would have been like, oh, my friend's doing this thing, I should join in. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, so, not, you know, I always would have liked to participate, but 2014 that was? I was still on the forums yeah. making shitty posts there. So <laughs> I I wasn't I didn't even know what the subreddit was. I didn't even know what Reddit was to begin with. So I wasn't around for that. With with the only games existing at the time being, you know, one, two, Brotherhood Revelations three and four. As of twenty fourteen. Yeah, I guess three and one would have been my least favorites out of that group. Yeah, I suppose so. It's I hard mean, to it's there's nothing in that group that would that I would have liked worse than three and one. Yeah. Interesting. Because now, now I, uh, let me see. I'm going to pull up my actual ranking list and see where AC1 scores. And this is still 2014 ranking? No, I'm going to pull up my current ranking list. Ah, okay. Uh, yeah. AC1 is in fourth place on my, on my last time I did this list. There's no way that that's accurate to now. 
it, it, would it be lower? Yeah. Yeah. I think I would have it just above Unity, Odyssey, Origins, and three. Yeah, I think I'd I'd take this over Unity for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So in general, I guess my yeah my experience with AC one was pretty rough, which is a shame because. There is a lot to like about it. There really is. Yeah. I, it definitely has the best story in, as far as the modern day goes. For, absolutely. Yeah. Mm. And the it definitely has the most consistent internal mythology of all the Assassin's Creed games. The way that it's presented for the, the layer of animus between you and the game, that's like really well done, I think. Yeah, and I, I had forgotten. I mean, I, I, I tweeted this out. Um, a little bit ago, I, I completely forgotten how well done the um, NS integration is. Now, yeah, keep in mind it has it has some rough edges. There are things I don't like about it. I, I found that it was pretty. It, it can get to the level where it pulls you out of the game a little bit to be like fast forwarding memory to a more recent one. Okay, well, thanks I'll tell you. I'll, me I'll tell you what's really annoying about the animus uh, about the animus stuff that uh, in this game that isn't in other games so much is when I get detected or anything happens, my screen has a fucking seizure. And it's like, <laughs> that doesn't help me with like uh, assessing my environment, you know? Like I get detected by one guard and like my screen flips the fuck out, you know? It's like, you know, we've prefaced as <laughs> you're saying that we like the animus integration in the HUD, but that is a feature I do not fucking miss. Fuck yeah. that. Because the, you like, get the, big because blurry... The, Oh, yeah, because detection in this game is not forgiving. And so you get detected all the time. And at least if you suck, like me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And me like, too, so too. my screen is flipping out all the time. And it's like, it gets me to the point where it's like, I don't even want to like participate in stuff. I might as well just go kill everyone. <laughs> like, with my yeah, sword. it'll literally be easier. Except for me, you know, something we've talked about a lot because, um, well, let me ask you this point blank. Just, I'm going to put you on the spot. Put me on the you spot. have always told me that, in your opinion, the best that combat has ever been in Assassin's Creed was AC1 after this replay. Is that still your opinion? As of right now, yes. Yes. Because What is wrong with you? No, the com- look, the combat is fine. It, th- there are other problems, like stealth being non-existent. <laughs> I actually had a big problem with the, stealth, with the combat, which was that I felt like it did not behave predictably. I felt like I could do exactly the right thing as far as countering or dodging or grab breaking or whatever. Like it felt like there was a chance element where even if I timed it exactly right on countering, it wouldn't counter or, so, or even if I didn't time it right, it sometimes would. I felt like I was constantly just playing the odds and I don't know why. So I, I, I do, I do see what you're saying a hundred percent because I even ran into that. So in no way am I saying that it's a perfect system. I think they started to go in the wrong direction with AC2, but that's a conversation for another time. But um, <laughs> I do think that in terms of just like visceral, like, you know, weighty and brutal combat, you know, like the way that certain enemies are just laying there writhing in pain when you're done. And, the, and like some of these animations... Like I, every time I would fight someone, I would or a group, I would see the same like four animations over and over and over. But they presented it in such a visceral way that I never got old. It was still so much fun, and I and I completely agree. I was not impressed by the animation at Variety. I thought it did get old after about three sequences. Well, look, I'm definitely there needs to be more animations. But I started switching to different between weapons just to like refresh my eyes, and I do that too. I'll switch between the short blade and the and the sword. But keep in mind, though, a big problem with the combat is simply that when you get hit, your screen flips out. So if, if memory serves, you know, I'm pretty sure that when you get hit by something like your, your screen, your entire screen gets taken up for like a frame. You know what I mean? Mm, yeah, there's definitely um, like a, a, a I don't know the word. It's an aberration of some sort where the camera and the and your character become dislodge from each other for a few seconds while it while it shakes around to, mm-hmm. to give you visual feedback it's a little aggressive i think yeah yeah so it's not perfect by any means and there are probably more like fun and mindless versions of the combat that are that have existed um, i don't even know if i'd say that i think there are better versions of combat full stop i think that there are games in, in assassin's creed that 
had more variety of animation, still were challenging and still were functional. And that didn't give me the same problems that uh, that AC one did. Right. I don't think it's as good. and I'm open to this opinion changing. It's just as of right now, I I've I've found that it kind of it does kind of scratch that itch of combat being kind of cinematic and uh, for me. And the thing is too is what I really like about the combat is while you know it can't canonically Altair you know doesn't even get a scratch during this whole game. There are plenty of ways to fuck up and the guard can like punch you in the stomach and you fall down or he can grab you and throw you. <laughs> the ragdoll physics or something else. Yeah, well not and not letting you have all of your skills at first, like grab break. Yeah. Does make it more challenging. I will say though, that does lead into another complaint that I have. Because something that I love about this game is that is like the narrative linked progression throughout. Like you get more skills, you get more wep you get you get better weapons throughout. Yada yada yada. However, I think it's a brilliant idea to strip you down and have you work your way back up. I think it is. An you just equally, want to see someone strip Altair down. <laughs> I think it is an equally bad idea to wait until like the end of the like, basically the end of the game to get you fully equipped with everything again. Yeah, that's very very fair. And like, I think it'd be one thing if there was any way that the game opened up or recontextualized its gameplay at the end of it itself that made it so that now that you have all these abilities there's actually something rewarding and fun to do with them but yeah you don't get to spend a lot of time at maximum assassin quality which is definitely a weakness of the game I yeah agree. you're 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 100 right on that it's just kind of like it's the same experience now you just have all the abilities you did at the beginning of the game and i and i like that idea that it's like you kind of in the in the beginning missions and stuff, you have, um, you have. You, you but even in the I guess even in the beginning, you don't have that much time to to utilize the grab breaks or the catch ledge and stuff because it's almost instantly taken from you. Which keep in mind, I don't have yeah. a problem with. It's just it's like the final ninth person. I I'm, I'm pretty sure, and then you get your shit back finally. Let me ask you this: Did yeah. you start warming up to the game? Once you started getting those skills back? I think so. There was definitely, I always was a big fan of the throwing knives in this game. So mm -hmm. once I able, was able to have like all of them and I could kind of use them more strategically as part of a stealth attempt, I definitely enjoyed that more. And just also a big part of it for me was getting comfortable with the systems as far as parkour and combat and quote unquote stealth go. <laughs> because there's a lot to get used to, especially when you've been trained on, you know, modern AC games. The parkour in this game is straight up garbage. <laughs> it is really bad. I've seen a lot of people like I saw a guy in on Twitter making a clip of like here's all the cool stuff you can do in AC1 parkour. I should not have to have Altair straight up like sniffing the ass crack of a handhold <laughs> to get to move to it. I feel like it's wor the worst part is when a big part of the gameplay in this game more than more so than in any other Assassin's Creed is getting chased. And when you get chased in this game, first of all, there's the whole Assassin's Claw thing we talked about. So you can't move the camera, which is right. just a nightmare. But then you have the fact that when you are climbing a, a building trying to escape from these people who are all like throwing rocks at you and stuff, it's so slow. You can almost hear all to your going, oh, which, which hand holds you? Go <laughs> <laughs> oh, may, maybe that one. Oh, yeah, okay, that there. Uh, <laughs> I guess we're going to that one. <laughs> and then you've been hit with a rock. And, you're on the and so you say, fuck it. And you go find a ladder. And you climb the ladder like a dumb little bitch boy who can't do parkour. <laughs> Or you just say fuck it and you get pelted with a rock, you fall down on the <laughs> ground and you just slaughter them. Yeah, or you just kill them all immediately. <laughs> I did notice one point I'll give to the combat is that I was much better at the combat once the game had already made me angry. <laughs> like if I was pissed off, I could slice and dice, nail the counter every time. <laughs> Which I guess is maybe a design like, <laughs> like intention. <laughs> but they had to really piss me off sometimes for me to do good parkour or good combat.
Like that one mission, there's a there's the assassination of <laughs> Ocker, where you think you can be stealthy. You climb up the, you, you sneak around all the guards, you climb to the top of the thing, you look down, he's in a keep. He's surrounded by like eight bad guys. And you think, because you've played good Assassin's Creed games before, you think you can air assassinate this guy. There's no air assassinate in the game. Uh, so you can't. So you there gotta is, try and just it, jump. There is. You just no, isn't. no. You can. You can tell me. You can tell me that I could have done it. I don't <laughs> believe you. I don't believe that I could have jumped off the scaffold and and done a perfect air assassinate. It's, it's I in kept the demo. trying to. It's in the demo. I kept, I kept trying to do it, and I couldn't. It couldn't do it. I I assume that's the game's fault, not mine. And then you have to fight like nine dudes and <laughs> Sabrand. You can only distinguish him because he's the only one with a bad haircut. <laughs> and so no. you try to focus your efforts on killing him. Because once you kill you're, him, you can just run away. You're getting it mixed up. It's not Sabram. It's, it's William. Yeah, you're right. It's William <laughs> de Montferrat. This is the second character I've accidentally called Sabrand on this podcast. <laughs> yeah, 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 That's think... the only name I, re- I remember. Um, okay, look. So, the, I, yeah, the air assassination is not very intuitive, but it does exist. Sure, if you insist. All I'm saying is that I got killed by those guards four times, which it turned out was the exact number of times it needed to happen for me to get angry, which immediately allowed me to slaughter them all. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, look, I mean, I kind of... Look, there's there's a fucking mission in here, too, that, like, where combat pissed me the fuck off, too. So the assassination's memorable, 100%. When it comes to the air assassinate, I, I look, I, I, I know it exists in the game, but it's not intuitive. And here's an example. And one of the assassinations I was doing, I climbed up the proper building. I killed the archer that was going to see me otherwise. And he's right in my view. And I leap off the building. I'm doing the air assassinate animation. Animation, excuse me. And then the last minute, last second, actually. Like. As my blade is approaching his fucking earlobe. As it's tickling his fucking neck hairs. He, like, does the whole animation of where he, like, catches me midair and throws me. And it's like, he didn't even know his back was turned to me, you know? And so, look, I know that there are people who fucking, like, massacre stealth in this game. It's just, I had such a problem with doing it effectively. And detection in this game is not forgiving. Call me, you know, like... Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Call me a pussy. <laughs> I just, You're a pussy, Tim. I'm just not... I, I didn't have a good time with the stealth, and... No. M- you know, perhaps it's because may- maybe it's user error. I just didn't have a great time with it. Just, just I also just on. think, yeah, I mean, there's something to be said for the fact that the, these missions designed, they're very linear. There's typically a stealth path and a combat path, and if you can... If you have eyes that work, you can at least see what the stealth path is. But then you're probably going to fail at attempting it, and you're going to feel like you didn't fail it because you were bad. You're going to feel like there was an unpredictability or there was a system problem that that caused you to fail it. We were watching an interview with Patrice Desilet where he was talking primarily about AC2, but he really views, he really thinks back on AC1 as like an experiment just to prove the viability of this world in this gameplay style and yeah. that really ac1 is more of a toy or a tech demo than it is an actual good game and i think that's probably yeah i think that's true which yeah. i have to give it credit for i mean we gotta be we gotta be real here i think ac1 is is a cool game like i really enjoy the world building i really enjoy the story I really enjoy the way that the character progresses over the course of the narrative. It's a simple game. It's a simple story. You don't get much of any of Altair's, you know, inner or outer life besides the process of killing these targets. But that's a form of limitation that I feel like they they did some interesting things with, you know? And the atmosphere of this game, the mood and the tone of it is unparalleled. Because as soon as AC2 came around, took things into the slightly more goofy blockbustery territory, and it's been in that world ever since. But I enjoy the the just the vibe of AC1. It is yeah. a vibe that is so distinct and so well crafted that that alone, in my opinion, saves the game from a lot of its faults. Yeah, I I agree, and it, I, it it's an atmosphere and a setting that I've been wanting to get back to ever since the first game. So. It, yeah. For, for 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 it to have that effect on me, 
it, it, it does it very well. What I will say, I do have a problem with, I guess, my, my only nitpick with like the atmosphere and the vibe is, I don't know, I, I suppose, I don't know, Altair doesn't really feel like he's a part of the world. Because he's voice acted terribly? Well, because well, does, does that make sense? Like, I just... Because he has the wrong accent and he's the only character in the entire game with the wrong accent? No, 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 not that. I, I know you. Ha- I, I know. I know that's a gripe for you, but what I'm saying is, I, I I don't know. There's like the lack of. I don't know. I I gotta. You can just probably cut no, this think, out because no. I, don't I think really- I get what you're getting at because something that we talk about in in class. For those of you who don't know, I am a a student of television writing. <laughs> that is what I've taken classes on. There's something that comes up a lot where they talk about the character's inner and outer life, and that's like all of the things that a character does, all the ways that they interface with, you know, their outer life being the people in the world around them, their inner life being their own feelings and their own characteristics in in that context. And versus someone like Ezio or really any other AC protagonist, there is no story about Altair that besides the fact that he kills people. And eventually uh, we learn that he gets jiggy with a Templar lady. So yeah, that, so you, that's pretty much right on the money because in the book, for instance, uh, which you need to read, uh, Secret yeah. Crusade, um, there's a lot of that momentum shifting where yeah. Altair will go from kill to kill, but you get his internal monologue, you get his internal feelings on everything. Even even when he gets back to Masia after um, leaving Malik. And his brother for dead, not leaving, but, you know, causing them to be kind of, yeah, betraying them a little bit. And and he gets back and the weight that you feel on Altair in the book is a lot different than in the game. And I'm not saying that the the game doesn't execute it properly, but when it comes to like the weight, like he feels ashamed and the inflections in his dialogue and stuff in that instance are, are represented a lot better in the book. And I understand that the book has the ability to be like this omniscient force and to be able to say Plus this it's, is what- it's coming after the game too. So they have all the context of what happens in the game. Of they course. get to adorn that with emotion and story. Right. And I'm not saying that the game doesn't hit you with those cues because Altair's character arc in this game is still one of the best. But you have to keep in mind, especially in a game without cutscenes at all. You don't see emotion in Altair's face. You don't see emo. You hardly see emotion in anyone's face. You don't hear he- emotion in his voice either. Yes, you, yes, exa- and I, I will agree with you on that. And so you can pick between like five camera angles in this game, but like none of them properly kind of like tell a story with the camera work and whatever. And and yeah. look, I like the over the shoulder look, but eventually it got a little old, and I just wanted to see like the camera turn around and. Show me Altair. It took us until Revelations yeah. to get a proper cutscene with Altair. Yeah. D- 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 like, does that make sense? You know? No, that makes perfect sense. That's our 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 criticisms are going hand in hand, where because of these these elements of the game, it, we are kind of deprived of a real, like fully developed characterization and fully developed uh story. And honestly, you know, there's a lot of like, I used to think it was really subtle and cool and interesting how Altair's understanding of the conflict evolves over the course of the story. Yeah. Honestly, coming back to it now with some of the things I've learned and some of the things I've, you know, explored in my, in, in college. And, and I, I can't say I, I like it as much today. Like I used to think it was subtle and cool. It's, it's definitely, it may be cool. It's not subtle. There are good three or four times in the story where Altair is like, it's wrong to kill people just for disagreeing with you while killing someone for disagreeing with him. Yeah. <laughs> that happens like three times at least that I count. Well, but I and, think, okay, so I, mean, I will it's say like, though, sorry, go ahead. Obviously on some level he gets the irony, but does he, you know? <laughs> well, that's the thing that is definitely explored in later games is the irony of the creed and all that. And, I think especially in AC2, they very much lean into the, it's, they still lean into that morally gray area of like, yeah, I mean, are the assassins really the good guys at the end of the day? Like, they might be the the more noble, maybe, or the more, like, righteous, but saying that they're good guys, you know, and that changed, that changed kind of later on, but I will say this game and 
the next definitely pick up on that a little more. I, I I don't know if you would agree. I don't know if I would. Ag- I mean, I think AC one definitely because of the way it treats the relationship between assassins and Templars, and because it isn't completely black and white. It's not like here are the the good assassins versus the evil Templars. There's some gray area. The assassins themselves are eventually pretty much revealed to be, you know, systematically corrupted by, yeah, it's by, yeah, by Templars. But at the same time, you know, you, you get the impression that we're not dealing with Jedi and Sith, right? In this, in this story, that's great that it does that in the first game because it kind of gives them license to, you know, later on, it's, it's still part of the identity of the creed and the identity of the conflict that there is that there is gray area, even though some games, I think AC2 being one of them, choose not to really explore that. I think AC2 is a good example, like many AC games, where the priority was not to really mine that that depth of conflict at all. The priority was more like, yeah, here are your assassin good guys, and here are your Templar bad guys. And the well, Templar bad guys are very bad, and they're obviously bad, and the assassins are obviously good. Well, keep in mind, though, I also do think in a lot of the confession scenes... Like, I, I do find myself sometimes being like, mm, and that was actually kind of a good point. And like, yeah, no, it is. It's believable <laughs> for all of these targets to think that they're doing the right thing. And all, and, uh, but Altair, all, that also affects Altair because Altair is like, yeah. what, like I'm, I'm questioning this. And, and that, I think, works very well in the context of the story. At the same time, though, I don't think that it's very believable to me that Altair is so surprised surprised to learn that the people he's killing think they're doing the right thing just because i find it to be the case nine times out of ten in real life that people are not typically thinking of themselves as doing the wrong thing even when they absolutely are like you could take the worst people alive today and you know you could interview joseph coney or whatever and he'd be like well actually i'm the hero of this story like i think most people think that way So for that to be kind of the driving force behind Altair thinking that there's more going on, like, I don't know, it's, it's, it's maybe a little simple. It's maybe a little not that deep. Yeah. I mean, I, I can't say I necessarily disagree with you on that one. I just, I also think like, it's a very smart way to develop the Templars beyond just mustache twirling. And that's true. Like, I do think that if you're a story designer on this game and you're given the gameplay system of you know, <clears throat> well, each level you, you go, you kill the guy and then you have a little chat in, in heaven about it. Right. Like the writers on this are using that opportunity. Like they're getting the most out of what systems are available to them. They're getting the most out of the fact that all of the, the story in this game is pretty much existing to motivate the gameplay. Right. Which is normal. That's how most games work. But they're doing it well in the sense that there's there's a clear, visible feeling of each kill that you accomplish, you are unlocking a different piece of the puzzle. Right. And I think in terms of most of your targets, they all seem like they're bound by like the Templar Order, obviously, but they all have independent motivations and independent like thoughts and feelings. And I, I think that's something that was lost for a little while on certain targets. Like, even though the assassinations that led up to them sometimes didn't work right for me or I had a bad experience with them, you know, for instance, like with the Sabran assassination, I will always remember that one because I remember parts of the context I was given as leading up to the story, or sorry, uh, leading up to the kill, the kill itself, and the confessions, and like the glitches and stuff, and you can, you know, press the button and get a different camera angle, and I think it's just... (sighs) I can't disagree with you on that one, Lassie. Well, I mean, you can, but I appreciate that you don't. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that kind of leads into the other thing I want that, that we want to talk about, which is the modern day, unless you had something else you wanted to talk about. I think that wraps up pretty much most of my... If there's anything that comes to mind, you could probably just move the edit around, I guess. Sure. Yeah, so modern day. Modern day. I vividly remember... Uh, when I actually started playing this game for the first time, which was right before three came out, uh, my parents like just got it for me as part of like a bunch of cheap games they picked up somewhere. And they were like, happy birthday, kiddo. Here's a, here's Assassin's Creed. And I was like, yeah, I've, I've known that this existed for a while, but it kind of became popular in a time when I was like too young to play a game that was completely about murder. So I booted it up and I had never 
ever been told or found out in any way that there was any modern day sci-fi elements to Assassin's Creed. I learned that while playing the game and that was a really cool moment cuz I'm I'm a big sci-fi guy. I'm not a big historical fiction or fantasy guy. So that immediately like pulled me into the world and contextualized the historical stuff in a way that made it far more interesting to me to to contextualize it as being part of this modern day ongoing saga versus just jumping around in history and playing different stories, right? Yeah. But I just remember the 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 cliffhanger at the end of AC1 just put me on my ass. Like I had to know. I had to know what happened next. I literally bicycled down to the post exchange the very next day and bought AC2 from GameStop. Yeah, I mean that that that's the thing is this game has probably the most like consistent view of the Assassins of Templars like in the modern day. Yeah. Because as we talk about a lot later on, you know, like in AC Gold, they're the underdogs or in, in the comic, they're superheroes. Yeah. And in this game, you really get the idea of like, you know, fuck, like even though Desmond technically is an assassin, you know, like his the, the rescue mission goes fucking terrible. Mm-hmm. And and we know and we, and we get these little hints that they've been dwindling in numbers for a while now because yeah. of the Templars. So the, the, the Templars have their thumb on the scale. And they pretty much and, directly reference the purge. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, 100 percent. Because that's the thing is, what other reason? Why would the assassins like go from like and, and, and that's the thing, too, is giving us such a giving us the crusades and the assassins then and then giving us the assassins in the modern day. And, but they do it in a way that's not jarring because we don't necessarily see them. We don't see them at all. Yeah. So they do it in a way that that's like very believable too, because the idea that like Desmond, you know, kind of like escaped his, his, his assassin um, compound or what have you. And well, it was originally, it was the farm, but I don't think they mentioned the farm in this game, but Desmond escaping, it still kind of gives you that idea that like, Maybe the assassins aren't necessarily like the most like um, accessible thing for for it, for just everyone. Which is like, why did Desmond want to run away from? But it also that that element kind of threw up some interesting questions for me. Where it was like, you know, on some level, Desmond is acting for the entire time that he's you know in Abstergo captivity. Like he doesn't know he doesn't know his ass from a hole in the ground. Pretty much the whole time, he's like, "What's all this? Assassins and Templars? That's crazy." <laughs> but then, then he's like, "Oh yeah, I escaped from one of their compound one time. I'm not. I don't consider myself an assassin." It's like, "Oh, so so you do know what they are?" Because a moment ago, well, yeah, well, yeah, because he says like he's like, "I'm not an assassin, not anymore." Yeah, I was a little unclear on that. I think he's just being coy. And I tried perhaps, to play this you know? whole game from the perspective that that Lucy is actually working for the Templars, even when she presents herself as otherwise and like it is a stretch well can we talk about that no yeah we can talk about that i uh, like especially you're playing this game i fucking hate that retcon like it makes no sense it's pretty stupid because it like it, it's just, uh, it doesn't make any sense it's it's it, it 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 it's actually if anything it's a better twist that lucy isn't a templar fuck face yeah it's not necessarily a twist but you know what i mean like that's so much more interesting than, oh, this woman at Abstergo also happens to be a Templar. Yeah. Fuck. And the fact that they reveal that she was a Templar in a DLC anyway makes me feel like you can almost get away with pretending it's not true. I, that's what I do. Fuck that yeah. shit, dude. Like, it's it's just like up until up until Revelations, it's not even like explicit. Yeah. Because the, 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 the big change happens at the end of, well, we'll talk about that when we get there, but just fuck. Fuck that. <laughs> and, and, and you can tell that this game has like certain pieces moving forward, like the fucking satellite that just gets forgotten about between AC2 and AC Brotherhood. And we know why that happened. Yeah. And it's just like, I, and I, look, I, I know there are certain people on Twitter that like will mention the satellite plot line. And I never quite got why people cared about it so much. Now I get it because I, I replayed and I realized that they were building up a lot of internal mythology about what Abstergo's plans were. And then to cash in on annual releases, they're like, ah, fuck that. No, and whatever. Yeah. And it's just, yeah, fuck off. <laughs> you know, it's like at a certain point, I get so cynical about it because just instead of completing an arc efficiently, they just 
they're worried about how they can keep making this make sense and stretch it out for longer games, and they fuck it all up. Yeah. They really fucked it up. Because when I play this game, I realize how much potential there is in the modern day, and especially through the emails, which you so much don't care for. I also couldn't find them. Like, I kept trying to interact with their computers um, every time I had a modern day interlude. And, like, it let me look at Lucy's once, but I could never look at Warren's for whatever reason. So, to get to get into Warren's, you have to pickpocket his pen off of him. Oh. Well, I never knew to do that. Well, there, there's a scene where he's like, get in the animus, Desmond! And he turns around from you, and you can walk up to him, and I'll just take that pen of yours to access your computer. And then the next time you come out of the animus, you can access his computer. And then, at the after the credit sequence... You can you you can get the code to the conference room, and you can get into the conference room, and then there's a laptop in there with with all the emails, one of which that we read during the conspiracies review. You're blowing my fucking mind, dude. Because like that's the kind of thing I would have tried to do when I played the game the first time, because I was so attracted to the mystery of the the modern day and and what was going on that I explored like every inch of the area that was available to me. And I tried to find all the opportunities to learn more stuff. And then after that, in like subsequent playthroughs, that felt less important to me because I've played the sequels. I know the answers and I know there's really not that much going on here, but I never knew you could get into the conference room. I also never knew you, I never changed the camera angles much during cutscenes. So every other playthrough, I missed the part where you could like actually see Alan Riken. Like, I think you and I had a conversation once where you were yeah. like, he's in the game, he speaks, he's, you can see him. I was like, no, he's not. <laughs> yeah, he's through the, he's through the conference. Mm-hmm. Like, I, like, at the very end, you can see him through the window, but he, he's, he looks he's exactly kind of like, like Jeremy Iron. He's kind of hard to see. Oh, yeah, he looks exactly like him. Yeah. But yeah, we can agree this is the best modern day ever. Yeah. And I mean, the emails to me also just represent like a, a completely different world that it that it ended up becoming. Like I think eventually, eventually it just started becoming our world, but with assassins and templars. Yeah. But I think in this game and a little bit in AC two, they are very much different worlds for sh- for sure. Yeah, there's a like, lot of that world building some, stuff. Some of these, yeah, well, because some of these emails just represent like a like like a. The entire continent of Africa not being accessible because of a virus. <laughs> yeah. Or um, the fact that, yeah, like, I uh, I had a little brain alarm go off because when I read the one about, like, oh, people in America are taking refuge in Mexico. Like, I've seen that trick used once before, and it was in an episode of Sliders. Are you familiar with the show Sliders? I'm familiar with the sandwich. Sliders are is a show about people who... They, they can slide between alternate realities. And so each episode they're in a different dimension where things are different somehow. And in the pilot, he's like, he's crossed over to an alternate dimension and he's in the car and he's listening to the radio in the car. And it's like immigration between uh, the U S and, and Mexico is at an all time high. And uh, Mexico keeps wanting to shut us out. They're just looking for a better life people. And I was like, Oh, that's really interesting that they took a thing that, that we know about the world and they just did the opposite of it and don't justify it or explain it or explore it at all. That's really clever. It's not, it's not the most elegant thing, definitely. I suppose when I consider that email, though, I, I consider, like, what if Abstergo is, like, doing certain shit yeah. in America that people don't want to have happen anymore? No, there's some blanks you can fill in, and that is part of what makes it interesting. I think I agree with you on the level that AC as a whole would have been more interesting storytelling opportunities for the modern day. If they had committed to the whole idea that they're taking place in an alternate world, the way that those emails imply that they are, but I don't know that I would have wanted it to be the alternate world that is created by those emails. If that makes sense. Like I I love the concept of, yeah, obviously the assassin Templar conflict doesn't exist in our world. So to tell us that here's a world where it does exist and nothing fundamentally has changed about the world as a result, that does make it less interesting to me. So to do a different world with alternate world building and, and things that are true in, in terms of like the geopolitical scale and, and the way that people interact, that's, 
I think, a great idea. If they reboot Assassin's Creed, that's on my list of things I would want them to do. But I, I do think that the way that these emails are written, it's a little lazy. Yeah. To to a certain degree, I do think all of the emails that have to do with um, Abstergo happenings are very well written. Oh, yeah. Like, no, I mean, they're, emails, I think they're all pretty well written. I just I'm really just no, talking well, about like the yeah, choices no, that they made about some of the alternate no, no. stuff. I I know what you're saying. Oh, yeah. I'm not saying that, like, you're thinking they're not well written in terms of. I loved the way that they were kind of characterizing Lucy and, and, and Vidic, like in the Lucy emails that I read where she's all very, you know, she's like, she's very a serious email writer, you know, like we all know that person. And then Warren Vidic writes emails like a fucking boomer. <laughs> like, that's amazing. Yeah. She like, she's like she correcting like his grammar email. and he's like, why do you sign your emails? You loser. Yeah. Why do you sign your emails? It's at the top of the email. Anyway. It's like, I can see your name. Like, I just love that. That was great. And, but I, I love how he's also like a dick over the emails too. He's such an asshole. Vidic was a really fun villain. He was just, he was very kind of scene chewing over the top bad guy. Another thing that's wasted in this fucking series. The things that he says about the Templar ideology, like it all made sense as far as like, I can see an organization that's pretty, maybe well-intentioned organization that's just trying to end violence and create peace and and all of that. Like it just, it it, it worked. There was something kind of poetic about the way that these ideologies played off each other and the way that some of these games, especially AC one used to take advantage of that conflict was, it was just something else. The thing that this game does very well is kind of like in giving you an inch at a time of exposition, like in the conversations that Desmond and Vidic have, yeah. you really get an idea of like, I guess what I'm trying to say is you always go, you always leave one of their conversations wanting more. Yeah. Like when, when Vidic is like their gifts, from those who came before oh. and you're like what the fuck does that oh mean? that was such a cool line you know? yeah i remember hearing that for the first time being like what and it was like it really felt like you were just learning more about the the puzzle you were learning more about the world and it nothing came out of left field it it, it all kind of built on itself like okay to learn that there's a race of precursors that would be a pretty big drop but they don't cover that in the first game really but they hint at it and if they've established that there are these magical artifacts like a piece of Eden, then, yeah, a very plausible explanation for that would be that they were left behind by a precursor race. But we just get that that little that little tip tease, that little tease of the tip that there's more going on. I well, love it. Yeah, that's the thing is it all comes down like this to the subtlety of it. I mean, it, there's a lot of conversation in the historical story between Amo Alam and, and Altair, and it's like. They're discussing the piece of Eden and things and events. Like there are certain events that Amwala m- mentions that like are explained away by a piece of Eden, but it, it all makes sense in this mythology. And I think at a certain point they just they really overplayed their hand. Oh yeah. But when they when they were keeping it very close to the chest in this game and AC two and whatnot, like to me the entire time I was like, please just like give me more of of like this stuff in the modern day. Yeah. Because you can make a good modern day conflict story, but you what you can't get back is those little nuggets of precious information that they just gave to us. And all the mystery that they've completely blown the load. Exactly. Of. And that's the thing is that's why I think that's a big part of why these modern days stand out so much is because we knew so little and we wanted to know. So we much. had to, and we exactly. And we had to fill in the gaps ourselves until he told us otherwise that, and, and that's what's missing is because now we know too much. You know, you took the words right out of my dick. <laughs> I hope I did. I agree completely. Oh, here's a little note that I had that I wanted to mention. Maybe I'll slide this in somewhere. Go for it. The sound in AC one is very, very bad. <laughs> there's some cool okay. sound design things i like the you know the piano thing the, when you collect a flag or whatever i like the, yeah. the really dramatic whoosh uh, of when you assassinate someone with the hidden blade but the music i mean these are very iconic sound effects. the music yeah, is all over the place in my opinion there's stuff that sounds very like you know you got that really iconic like i think theme in damask where it's like Da, na, na, yep. Da, mm-hmm. na, na. Exactly. Like that's great. But then you have like the chase music, which is cool, but also sounds like it's from the Matrix. Like it's very sci-fi. <laughs> you 
know what I mean? Like that early 2000s yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. sound aesthetic. And there's just no, like, I feel like there's no cohesion. Like there's a lot of really cool modern sounds and cool old sounds, but nothing is blending them together remotely well at all. I, I don't I don't I don't disagree. I like I yeah, I mean like you said, I love the hidden blade sound effect. I, I it needs to sound like that again, yeah. I think. And there's a cool um, like like I think that a lot of those pieces of music on their own are great. It's just in the context of all of it together, it's a very jarringly all over the place soundtrack. I also think that one of the big problems with <laughs> I mean, look, we're not gonna be the first people to shit on the uh the ambient dialogue. It is jarring that each city has the exact same lines of dialogue. They've just replaced the accents. But what makes it, I think, more annoying is the fact that, um, I don't know if you noticed this, playing AC1, the sound of someone talking in the city, in most normal games and in every other Assassin's Creed game, the farther you get from that source of sound, the quieter they get. And, you know, you move your head to the left or right, you'll hear them in the left or right. It's positional audio. AC1 Mm -hmm. doesn't do that at all. It's all just like in the mix at full volume. And that volume doesn't change whether you're on a rooftop or uh, the top of a tower. You're going to hear, you know, someone say, thief, you are filth at top volume unchanging. It's very jarring and distracting. And also, I think what they have are they have these like nodes that essentially emit the sound. Um, positioned throughout the city. So if you are standing nearby to one of those nodes, you are going to hear whatever line of dialogue is programmed to it over and over and over again. So if you find yourself standing on a rooftop for any reason, for any period of time, you're going to hear a constant loop of, I'll have your hands for that. I'll have your hands for that. (laughs) I'll have your hands for that. You're so right. So it's very poorly done, even by (laughs) 2007 standards. If anyone wants to jump in the comments and tell me that I'm actually wrong about the system or I'm wrong about how it was done uh, or that there's like a really good reason why they did it that way. But I'm pretty sure immediately in AC2 that's corrected and I never have that problem again. Well, also, the t- something worth mentioning is that the just ambient talking from crowds and people in, uh, in AC2 is done a lot better than AC1. Yeah. Like, because... Uh, well, I, I I guess we won't. I guess I won't go into a tangent. Oh, I just wanted to mention that I really like how the animus looks, and I think it looks really like they. I how cumbersome it is. The fact that there's like a whole, a whole section, a whole corner of the room yeah. that's dedicated to servers alone. Mm-hmm. You know, kind of makes it really stupid that Layla just pulls out a fucking animus in her, out of her pocket. They literally fucked that part of the animus by game two. Yeah, I'm not disagreeing with you. <laughs> I'm saying that this game. This game and, does and, it the best. And by AC4, it's a VR helmet. Uh, yeah, I'm not. I, I, I'm just giving that as one of the egregious examples. Yeah, I no, think, that's fair. That's fair. I, I think there are plenty. I think there are plenty like yeah. AC4. I thought AC2, when Rebecca Crane was being like, they just have no passion, no competitive edge. Anything they can do, I can do better. I was like, yeah, all right, sure. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you say, Crane. Cool. <laughs> but we have more to talk about AC2 later. <laughs> yeah. We're gonna do an episode just on the, just on the corrupted sequences only. All in all, Assassin's Creed One. You know, it's kind of like when you have a parent you don't like very much. Like you got to give them a lot of credit. They did create you, but I've really lost track of this metaphor. Um, no, yeah. Well, they they kind of made you who you are, they kinda, but they, you moved you moved on to better parents. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, 13 parents later, they're kind of all losing their magic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, AC1, I gotta give it credit, great atmosphere, great tone, definitely the starting point, and if it had not sold as well as it had, we may not have gotten uh, the Assassin's Creed we know and love and hate today, but um, really not that fun to play, and I will probably never play it again. I think I'm done with AC1. I've I've reached my AC1 quota. But sound off in the comments. Do you guys do you love AC1? Do you hate AC1? What what do you think? This is the official podcast of hating Assassin's Creed and still somehow liking it enough to be doing a podcast on it at all. Yeah, somehow, some way. We're we're home to many contradictions on this show. We really are. 
All right, go out and get yourself a Ninja Foodie. <laughs> go buy a June oven or whatever it's called. <laughs> a Juno oven. Juno a, oven. A June oven. Juno what a I mean. Oven. <laughs> As always, there are ways to support the show. If you enjoy listening, you can send our linky poos and linky pies to your friends who like Assassin's Creed and or podcasts. Um, you can leave us a comment telling us what we got wrong about this treviso treviso if you have any fact checks you want to make <laughs> leave them in the comments but also message them to us and put them on our discord server so <laughs> thank you all for for listening thank you for interacting we we love you we love 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 you mwah, 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 mwah. i have been the blade and i've been the hook i've been the hook this time around guys and this has been the hook blade podcast see you next week and the blade, so you can use one or the other.